force and power and passion that he betrays this idea of disinterestedness. He's very clearly taking an interest in this kind of beauty. Um, at the end of section 6 on the top of page 74, it says, And could one not finally urge upon Schopenhauer himself the objection that he was very wrong in thinking himself a Kantian in this, because in his discussions of art and beauty, he's so passionate about it, that he did not at all understand the Kantian definition of the beautiful in the Kantian sense, that the beautiful is pleasing to him too out of an interest, out of the strongest, sorry, even out of the strongest of all, the, per, the most personal of all interests, namely that of the torturer, that of the tortured, one who breaks free from his torture. And to come back to our first question, what does it mean when a philosopher pays homage to the ascetic ideal? We get at least a first hint here. He wants to break free from the torture. Um, so that's going to be the first hint at what ascetic ideals mean here. Uh, skip down to line 15. For let us not underestimate the fact that Schopenhauer, who in fact treated sexuality as a personal enemy, so this is like asceticism, needed enemies in order to remain in good spirits. Okay, so you might imagine something like this, that um, when he, as all embodied humans do, had physical, material urges, like sex drive. Uh, he treated that as an enemy. He treated that as something to be conquered. And so he was able to, tried to do, was to will the suppression of those drives. To experience the strength of overcoming those natural instincts self-denial. Uh, line 6 over on 75. Um, every animal, and thus also um, the philosophical animal, he says, instinctively strives for an optimum of favorable conditions under which it can vent its power, express its will, its will to power, completely and attain its maximum in the feeling of power. Um, this is, again, what human beings strive to do, is to express their um, strength, express their will. Okay, so um, very bottom of 75. Uh, what, accordingly, does the ascetic ideal mean for a philosopher? My answer is one long destined long ago. At the site, uh, uh, at the site, at its site, the philosopher smiles at an optimum of the condition for highest and boldest spirituality. In this, he does not negate existence. Rather, he affirms his existence, and only his existence. And this, perhaps, to the degree that wanton wish can never, uh, is never far away. Let the world perish, let there be philosophy, let there be the philosopher, let there be me. Okay, so the ascetic philosopher does not negate existence, but rather his existence, for example, by demonstrating power over his sexual drives, in the case of Schopenhauer. This is a venting of his power over himself, over his material existence. Um,
with the highest spirituality. Um, and from the, the outset, then, he says, it will not astonish us if the ascetic ideal has always been treated with considerable prepossession precisely by philosophers. Um, a serious historical reckoning proves the tie between ascetic ideal and philosophy to be even closer and stricter still. One could say that it was only on the apron strings of this ideal of ascetic, ascetic self-denial that philosophy ever learned to take its first steps and half steps on earth. Alas, ever so clumsily, poorly, in a disjointed and uh, um, immature way. But philosophy got its start through asceticism. Philosophy got its start through a certain kind of self-denial, a certain kind of self-discipline, and certain kind of otherworldly uh, contemplation. Okay, and now we get the discussion of the first form of that otherworldly contemplation. So this is the basically the first form that philosophy took. And it's in the person of the ascetic Christ. Um, this is where the Okay, so philosopher, I'll, I'll say it this way, this is where the contemplative life, the reflective consideration of life, the intellectual reflection on life first appear in the person of the ascetic um, So he's talking about this um, on uh, page 83. Um, look at line 20. It says, the idea we are fighting here about here is the valuation of our life on the part of the ascetic priest. How does the ascetic priest value life? He relates our life together with that to which it belongs, nature, the world, the entire sphere of becoming and of transitory, the empirical world, the physical world. He relates our life and all of that stuff to an entirely different kind of existence, which it opposes and excludes, unless, perhaps, it were to turn against itself, to negate itself. In this case, uh, so, the, so the only time, according to the ascetic priest, that our embodied physical life is valuable is when it's turned against itself. Sorry, it's 83. So this is section 11, just about the middle of page line 20 there. Um, so I'll say again. Um, how does the ascetic priest value life? Well, it's not valuable because it's part of this empirical physical world. Some other world is what's really valuable. The only time that a life here in on planet Earth is valuable is when it's turned against life here on planet Earth, only under the guidance of asceticism. Unless perhaps it were to turn against its not valuable, unless perhaps it would turn against itself to negate itself. Um, in this case, the case of an ascetic life one turned against Life is held to be a bridge for that other existence in heaven, a non-earthly, non-worldly existence. Um, he says, um, such a monstrous manner of valuation is not, as, is, is not inscribed into the history of mankind as an exception and a curiosity. In fact, this kind of monstrous valuation in which something is valuable only when something uh, something material, something physical, is valuable only when it's turned against itself is not an exception. He says. This is in fact something that occurs again and again and again in human history. 
is one of the broadest and longest facts there, there is. So somehow, he says, this monstrous kind of valuation in which what is valued is self-denial must actually somehow serve the interest of life itself, even though, again, on its face, and this is supposed to be paradoxical, right? On its face, it's turned against life, against our embodied existence. But somehow, in a disguised way, it must be life-affirming because it keeps recurring. Because our modern history has been dominated by this idea. Line five. It must be a necessity of the first rank that makes this species that is hostile to life grow and prosper again and again. It must be in the interest of life itself that this type of self-contradiction not die out. Um, okay, and so this is what um, we're trying to solve. Because, he says, for an ascetic life is a self-contradiction. Here a resentment without equal rules, that of an uns uh, uh, unsatiated instinct and power that, will, that, uh, that would like to become lord not over something living but over life itself, over its deepest, strongest, most fundamental preconditions. Okay, so this is the paradox that we need to try to solve. How to uncover how it is that something that is aimed at self-denial is in fact a kind of affirmation. Okay, so uh, section 12 then. Let's, let's imagine what kind of metaphysics such a set of priest who values self-denial would project. Because remember for Nietzsche, that metaphysics is a projection of values. Well, um, section 12. Supposing that such an incarnate, incarnate will to contradiction in anti-nature is to prevail upon, is prevailed upon to philosophize, to make up a philosophy, to make up a metaphysics, on what will invent his innermost capricious will? Uh, on what is most certainly felt to be true or real. He will seek error precisely where the true life instinct most unconditionally posits truth. For example, he will denote physicality to an illusion. Likewise, pain, multiplicity, the whole conceptual opposition between subject and object. These are errors, nothing but errors, he says. Um, so. Uh, so this kind of system of values is going to create a metaphysics, is going to create a philosophy that deprecates our material, empirical, <clears throat> phenomenal existence in the name of a true world, the way things in themselves truly are, that's detached from our merely empirical existence, our merely empirical interaction. So there would be a true world that is of true value, where something is an end in itself, not part of the empirical world, where things are um, as they are in themselves, and um, our merely empirical existence, our merely empirical inclinations and desires are of little or no worth in comparison to um, ends in themselves.